here we go, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, local realtor here, Fadi Kuder, with Sutton Group Ottawa. And this show is all about interviewing business owners here around the city. And today, what better than one of my favorite businesses in the city, Nasser Nasser from Juice Dudes. How are you, buddy? I'm very good. Thank you for the nice intro. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for making the time for us. It's been uh, quite some time we've been trying to get you on the show. And we're always, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it next week. Yeah, yeah, maybe in a week after. But I really appreciate that we finally put the time together. My I know you guys pleasure. have been really, really busy. So what I want to do is I want to start off with the story about Juice Dudes. Tell me the story. How did it start? Do you want the long version or the short? The version? long version. We've got about an hour. Okay. I'll <laughs> give you the long version. I'll still make it short, but I'll give you the long one. So my family has been farming fruit since the late 1800s, so mm -hmm. generations. And when you grow up with a bunch of farmers, small-time farmers, you learn to stay away from entrepreneurship because they have to go through all the hard work. They have to work seven days a week. They have no benefits. They're not really making all that money. They never get to take a vacation. Yeah. And they have to do everything themselves because you know they don't know how to build a business where they can trust other people to run their business. So you learn to really stay away from that and you kind of pursue you know, getting a degree, getting a nine to five benefits and so on and so forth. So I ended up going to engineering school. This is what they wanted me to do, so mm -hmm. I did it. Did well at it, but I hated it. Did not enjoy it. They you and me both. <laughs> yeah, you, you did engineering too. I did engineering for two years, and then I quit, and I went into economics. My dad almost had a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's the dream, right? An yeah. Arab Arab household is either a doctor or an engineer. That's it. That's There's it. no in between, man. Yeah, it's funny because I wanted to do economics, and my dad almost had a heart attack. <laughs> so I ended up doing engineering, and you know, at the time. You know, I'm also analytical. I saw that, you know, there's a lot more opportunities for engineering. So I did it anyways. Long story short, here I was 2017 going to Auto U, just landed from Lebanon and trying to get my credits for all the years that I did in engineering mm -hmm. back home. And of course, they wouldn't give me any credits. They want to make money, right? Of course. They wanted me to go back from scratch. The good old story of immigrants coming in thinking like, yeah, I'm just going to run in and start something right away, right? Yeah. Yeah. never materializes yeah yeah so yeah they wouldn't give me any credits luckily i say luckily because that led me to quit and try to just basically work full-time been working since i was 12 but at, the, at that point i'm like let me just work without school let me see what's that like next thing you know i'm working at a pizza shop i'm making pizzas i'm washing dishes i'm delivering pizzas and and one thing led to another and i ended up landing a sales job mm-hmm now at the sales job, I did very poorly in the beginning because my English was horrible. I was in 2017 and I didn't really know the, the culture here. I, I didn't really catch on all the, the cues. Yeah. So it was, it was very tough in the beginning. I wasn't really selling and it was a commission only job, but I would work friggin' six days a week, come back home after 12, 13 hours of work and I study sales and I learn about sales, videos, read, do everything I could. A few months later, fast forward, I ended up doing well, you know, for 23 years old or 24 year old at the time, I was doing very well for, for, for myself in terms of making money. Two years in, I just realized, I, or actually before I realized that, I read this book, it was my first book. I read one sentence in that book that literally changed my life. And it's a cliche, it's a very simple, You're very waiting for sandwich. it? Yeah. Let us know, what is it? Do what you love and you will never work a day in your life. 100 freaking percent, bro. That is probably the epitome of true entrepreneurship. If yeah. you ever decided to do the thing that you love the most, yeah. you'll never have to work. It just becomes like a autopilot. Yeah. If you, if, you wanna, if you ever end up doing something that you would do for free to actually make money, you're gonna make a lot of money. Yeah. Because you're gonna you're gonna really focus on it. So, anyways, this is when it hit me. It's like a hook on the chin. I'm like knocked out. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I'm 24. I have no kids. I have no house to pay its mortgage. Yes, I'm doing kind of well now, but I was broke my whole life. So what if I take some risk and I and I, and I end up broke again? And what better time to do it? What at better time to right? do it at 24? Who cares? Nothing to lose. Yeah, exactly. So I ended up digging into my passions and I realized there's two, three things that I'm very, very passionate about and, and I wanted to do a business around that. Number one, it's entrepreneurship. 
I don't care what my parents told me. I don't care what they taught me. I was born to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. That runs through my blood. I cannot make myself stop watching Shark Tank. I want to watch it every day, all day. I want to read about business. I just I just love this. I love connecting with people and kind of yeah. creating value and giving it to people. I love everything about business. The other thing that I really liked was food. You do not understand, Vadi, how much I like food. It's... When people hang out with me, they say, yeah, you're a foodie. Okay, cool. But when they spend a couple of days with me, I'm like, oh, this, this shit is funny. It's, 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 it's just not re- not even real. Yeah. My whole day, right, I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to eat next? What am I going to experience next? Uh, what restaurant am I going to try? Like, there's nothing that pops up in the city and I'm not really familiar with it. There isn't the cuisine that I haven't really experienced. If I travel, I just came back from New York. I was trying six, seven places a day before I went there, a month ahead, I had my list all prepared. Mm-hmm. It's it's like a sickness, <laughs> but it's a good sickness. It's an obsession. It is an obsession. I wanna I wanna experience as much culinary experiences as but possible. But that's the thing, you you really only live once, right? Yeah. Like especially when it comes to food. Don't get me wrong. It's 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 like a, a blessing to be able to try something yeah. new and then like the taste buds just like they're singing. 100%. Every time you're having it. Yeah, to I'm me, hungry it's as a, I'm speaking right now. If, if I'm ever, if I'm ever eating something good and you're around me, you're gonna hear the weirdest noise ever. Like sometimes mm, I can't even mm. put it in words. Um, so long story short, of course, I, I could never stop watching food shows as much as Shark Tank. And, uh, I love cooking. I love making food. I love making people happy. If I cook something and I give it to you and then you really enjoy it and you start making these noises mm, and stuff like that. It just means everything to me. That's yeah. all I want from life, you know? So uh, long story short, I ended up combining these two passions, business and food. Now, when you combine that, what do you end up with? What you love. Food business, right? I did my research. And it turns out food business is the hardest business. 100%. Yeah. And, and this is coming from someone that owned a restaurant for four years. Yeah. And we did really well in those four years, but it was always a grind. Yeah, always yeah. a grind. Yeah. Always trying to make the customer happy. You're always, you know, worried about the service that you're delivering. You're always worried about the food, if it's good or bad. The cooks, if they're actually doing their job properly, and it's just like that. It's a service industry at the end of the day, right? It's not just like you're in the business of pleasing people. Hundred percent. And you can't please everybody. You can't please everybody. Look, uh, I don't know about you can't please everybody. There's ways to make it happen, but it's very, very hard. Very, mm-hmm. very hard. But what I always say to people when they tell me food and they want to get in the food business, I tell them, think about it this way. You're in real estate. You probably handle one to two transactions a week if, if, you're, if you're an absolute beast, and I know you are. In our business, every store handles about two to 300 transactions. Every one of these customers have extremely high expectations. Yeah. And they have every right to because they're coming and they're paying money. And we're not cheap. We we charge for our juice because we make great stuff. So they come, they want an amazing product. They want to walk in the door and be greeted as soon as they open the door. They don't want to be greeted like when you go to Tim Hortons until you get to the cash and get awkwardly served, right? Mm-hmm. And they want to be, you know, walk through the menu by a knowledgeable uh, person at the cash, not just a person who's going to ask, hi, what can I get for you? They want a person that knows how to give them recommendations that can actually explain yeah. the menu. And then and then beyond that, they place their order. They don't want to wait forever. They want their order to be done in five minutes, regardless of how busy we are. And after that, they want an order that looks amazing. All the ingredients are great, tastes fantastic. When they're having their orders, they expect to be checked on, you know, a few minutes in as if they're in a fine dining, which is exactly what we do, although yeah. we're not in a fine dining. And then at the end, they expect to be greeted again, and, and maybe throughout their experience, they want to be connected with from our team. They're going to come in, and they're going to ask about them, and they're going to actually have a genuine conversations. So in order to achieve these expectations for two to 300 people a day, it is not, it's, it's quite simple to me, because I understand it very well, but it's not easy. Although I've been doing it for five and a half years, it's just not easy to achieve that um, in, in a very short time with five to ten minutes. This is, this is yeah. your chance to yeah, make yeah. it or break it. And you mess it up, man, it's very, it's very hard for them to come back. So you got you to gotta stay on your toes. Anyways, we're sidetracked right now. Back to the story. Uh, I realize this is a very hard business to get into. 
So I decided to find something that is a niche where there's a lot I need for it, but there isn't a lot of people doing it. Mm -hmm. I do my research and it turns out that niche is juice. In 2019, early 2019, I'm just going to talk about Ottawa, although it's the case in most places in the world. When you want to juice, you have two options. It's either something that tastes good, but it feels like crap after mm -hmm. because it's loaded with sugar, sugar and syrups yeah. and frozen yogurt, etc. Or something that tastes like shit to begin with. It's probably healthy, but it just tastes bland and has no yeah. flavor uh, or, or it just straight up tastes bad. So... Being in farming my whole life, I, I was confident that I can bring something. I was farming fruits my whole life. I, I could make a juice or a drink. I don't want to just say juice because it doesn't do juice to its justice. I, wanna, I wanted to create drinks that taste fantastic but also feel good after. Mm -hmm. And in order to do this, to me, it's very simple. You just use good, fresh fruits. And because I was... In the fruits business, my whole life, I know how to pick good fruits. I know how to, I know what the flavor is supposed to taste like. So therefore, I can, I can, I can totally achieve that. And this is how basically the concept came to life. And fast forward September 2019, which is a few months after I made that decision, uh, we ended up opening Juice Dudes. So for folks that are watching, and especially uh, entrepreneurs that are thinking of doing something, big or small. How do you go about getting started? Well, first thing you do, well, the first thing I did, I'll, I'll just talk about myself and I'm going to give people advices. Maybe I'm wrong. I, you're uh, making my life easy from a real estate perspective, right? So that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because I always have to explain it, but I want you to explain it now. Yeah. So first thing you do is that, the first thing I did is is I founded what I, I, I was looking for, what I really love. Because like I said, if you were to do it for free, happily, you're going to make a lot of money doing it as a business, right? I did that, and then I would find a niche where there isn't a lot of competition, but there's a lot of need for it. You don't want to, you know, you can open a great pizza store, and you may do very, very well, but it's going to be very hard for you to do well because you have a fucking pizza store in every block. So yeah. it's a lot of competition. You're going to be worried about your prices the whole time. You're going to mm -hmm. be worried about so many things the whole time. So find something that is that is that is a niche, and it has to it has to be of a lot of value. If people don't need it, don't do it. They, you need to give people value. Yeah. If, if you don't give them That's value, like the, the number one hard. thing when it comes to sales, right? Like if there's yeah. no need, you can't make a sale. Simple. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and 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 neither should you. Like if I, when I was in sales, if if I ever felt uncomfortable selling something to someone, I, I just don't. And when you do this, people really trust you and and, and, yeah. and they tell other people and you end up making good sales. And then from there, you got to do a lot of research. By research, I mean don't overthink it, right? Don't spend fucking two years trying to research whether or not you want to do that. Spend a limited amount of time. Set, set a limit. Two, three weeks, whatever. You do that. And then the next step, which I learned right now, I didn't do earlier because I, I didn't know. The next step would be talk to someone who's already done it and was successful at it, yeah. right? And by that, they don't necessarily have to be the same exact business, but it's something similar of value or of, exactly. of you know, kind of service or whatever. Exactly. Like, for example, if I want to start real estate, I can talk to somebody that's already started real estate. Exactly. If I want to start a um, shoe repair business, I might yeah. talk to someone that's been in that mm -hmm. and see if there's kind of a need there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I'd say, my number one hack at this time. I just want to talk to people who's already done what I'm trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find someone that is going to do the exact same thing because you're always looking for a niche, right? But this is like you're talking to someone that you're boiling down years of experience in, in a 15 or 30 minutes meet. conversation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally, totally. And, 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 and then take a lot of notes and then go research every one exactly. of the notes. And then listen, that's the biggest thing is like really listen because a lot of people come to that with ego, right? Like you're coming in and you're like, oh, I want to open this. and like, But you have no idea what you're talking about. This person has tried it for how many years and they're giving you that in like a small little time capsule. So you just listen. Exactly. And yeah, these are, these are my biggest tips. So in order for you to secure a location, what was it like for you guys to go out and start kind of looking into that? 
so you're talking from a real estate perspective. Yeah. Okay. And we'll go back to the business perspective in a second. I just want to kind of. That's a story on its own. Yeah, exactly. It was, uh, it was a very interesting <clears throat> story. So at the time, remember, I was 24, an immigrant kid. I, I had a bit of an accent. I'm trying to start a business, right? So I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So what do I do first? I called the first real estate agent. I learned a couple things, and then I used these couple things to call the other real estate agent. And now I sound like I know a little bit. Because unfortunately, it's the reality. In commercial real estate, when you call people and they notice that you don't know, they, they really don't want to mm-hmm. work with you. Uh, because landlords, I, I get it now, they don't want to give their businesses to people that don't know business because they're going to end up failing and then they're going to end up... Yeah, they're hedging their bet on somebody that's... Exactly. For yeah. five years, maybe, exactly. minimum. And, and they may fail in two years and exactly. now they have to find another f- yeah. tenant. It's a big And it does cost. And this is another thing, too, that most people don't understand is that as a landlord, it does cost you money to put somebody in. Yeah. So it's not free. So, yeah, that's what we did. I called a bunch of agents, learned a bunch of stuff. I remember at this point, I, I called this agent. The guy was so fucking arrogant. It was it pisses me off until this day. <laughs> Anyways, the guy wanted to make me feel stupid. The entire conversation, I shit you not, is from Remax. I can't remember his name, but I can get it if you want. I don't care. No, 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 no. No, no, no names. <laughs> let's, Anyways, let's leave people out of it. So he asked me a bunch of questions, and then eventually he asked me, what's your covenant cost? I said, I don't know. I've never heard that word before. I said, honestly, I don't know what this means. He's like, that's it. I'm not interested in working with you. And he hung up the phone. Man, I was boiling. I I, I couldn't. I called him back. I did my thing (laughs) so I could sleep at night. And I'd say, he's going to think twice before he does this to someone else. Mm -hmm. At at this point, I realized that, you know, it's not going to be easy to find a location. So I get in my car. I drive all around the goddamn city. I find a couple of places and I I do put offers on a couple of places that I really liked. One on in the Glebe, I remember. Anyways, long story short, they wouldn't take my offer. Um, at the point, I'm like, okay, n- no one is going to, you know, give it to a, an immigrant kid, right? And then I don't give up. I keep looking, I keep looking until I find this place in Westboro. So our store in Westboro, our first store, is... Uh, is, is in a very dark spot in Westport. There isn't even city light. So at night, you don't even see it. Mm-hmm. And I, I see the place. I'm like, oh, man, th- th- there's already a coffee shop there. So that's not going to be an expensive build. And I didn't have a lot of money at the time. So I'm like, this is perfect for me. But I realized that there isn't a lot of traffic there. So I'm like, you know, what options do I have? Everybody's turning me down. Let me put an offer on this place. So long story short, when time came for me to go and, and sit with these people, I, I then learned my lessons. I got a fake Rolex. I dressed up <laughs> and I went to that meeting. I oh. negotiated the turns and boom, they you gave me the look deal. The part, right? Yeah, exactly. And at the time I thought it was just a fake <laughs> Rolex, but then I realized that place has failed four or five times before we took it. So they're like, yeah, this guy's going to fail again. No problem. Smart business people won't take it anyways. Mm-hmm. So they gave it to me and that's how we got our first location. And, uh, it was a tough like beginning. Little they know is like you have no quit, buddy. Yeah, yeah. And well, how many stores are we at today? We're at two, but we're currently in the process of building four. Uh, so we're going to be at six by the end of the year. This nice. Is, this is the goal. Nice. Yeah. And you guys turned this into a franchise. Yeah. So tell me the story about that. How did you come up with, let's do this? Yeah, the franchise aspect. Kind of like everybody's dream. Like, that's the reason why I'm, I'm asking that question. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, from the very first moment we opened, I I told my brother, he laughed at me at the time. I'm like, this is going to be the Starbucks of juice. He's like, you know, hold your horses, buddy. I'm like, I'm I'm not in it to have a juice bar. You know, I want to make people happier and healthier all over the world. I don't want to I don't want to just do it in Westboro. I want to do it everywhere. I believe that everybody deserves that. So that was the goal from the very beginning. That was the vision and never changed. Mm -hmm. Now, when we first started, there was tough because of the location. The concept was very weird to people. When I give them like a nice rainbow dude full of fruit chunks, they were like, what the hell is that? Blend it for me. You know, (laughs) it was a tough beginning. But then a few months later, slowly things started to pick up. As soon as it picked up, COVID hit. I remember at that that point on a Friday night, I had no staff. I couldn't afford them anymore. I was working by myself. I sold Fatty for about $76 the entire Friday night. For reference, now we can do 10, 15K easy. So at that point, that was the rock bottom. 
but I just kept remembering why am I in business? I'm not in business just to make money. Mm -hmm. I love making people happy with food. I love making people healthier with food. And this is all I wanted to focus on. When you walked into my door, uh, Fadi, until this day, it becomes my mission to make you smile. I don't care how, I'm going to make you smile. Yeah. This, is, this is my absolute goal. And I've experienced this multiple times, whether at the uh, Bank Street location or Westboro, and, and I do it on purpose while you're not there. Because I don't want... Uh, because I know your staff know if I show up and you're there, it's a different story. I try to be low under the radar. Show up and just see how the, the experience is. And it's always so pleasant. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, like I walk <laughs> out and I'm like, man, I feel like, sure, I spent 16 bucks on this, but I feel like I'm uh, freaking a million dollar right hey, man, now. We have $6 drinks. The people are going to think all no, our drinks I'm are kidding, 16 I'm bucks. Kidding. Not all of them. <laughs> I choose certain stuff that's really different. So. Yeah. So, so at that point, I literally saw no people, no customers. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how can I make people smile? How can I make them smile without even seeing them? So what I did is that I ended up writing small written notes, you know, with my handwriting and, and um, nice little messages to people. You know, next thing you know, people really, really appreciated that. We still do it to this day, by the way. Every Uber order, we don't get to see the customer to make them smile. We write them a message to make them smile. And, you know, slowly but surely, People started noticing. And, and then, you know, with COVID, a lot of food businesses uh, used COVID as an excuse to kind of cut corners when it comes to ingredients and processes and wait time and all this kind of stuff. For me, again, it wasn't about money. Yeah. I wanted to make people happier and healthier. So every chance I have to invest in my ingredients to improve my product and the customer experience, I was taking that chance. You know, sure enough, things started to pick up. And overnight, man, we started to boom like there's no tomorrow. Like ever since that point, my only problem was finding Staff. team members <laughs> that can help us, you know, cater for all these people. And of course, at that point, we were being approached. That was in 22, in the middle of COVID. We were approached by multiple people for franchising. They wanted to franchise. And at that point, I'm like, this is the goal, but I'm not ready for it now. I was at a point where... I had to be at the store all the time. I didn't have a system. I didn't have a process. The whole business was me. If I'm not in the store, things are not going to go well. Therefore, I never left the store. Yeah. At that point, I realized I actually injured my knee and I couldn't make orders anymore. I'm like, what the hell? I'm, I'm, I'm going to close the store. I'm like, man, I'm a terrible businessman. What kind of business is this that relies completely on me? If I, if I hit my knee, I have to close the store. That yeah. makes no sense. So I realized that I need to build a system where things can be consistent with or without me. And this is when we started, uh, you know, building that. It took about two years, invested a lot of money to that, a lot of time into that, hired a lot of consultants, people that are very smart at it, people that has done it before. And we ended up building that system. And as soon as that system was ready, I'm like, okay, now we're ready for franchising. Let's talk to lawyers to, to make that happen. And this is, this is how it happened. Amazing. It was actually, uh, it's funny you say this, I introduced JC about a couple of weeks ago to a friend of mine that is specifically, you know, that's his focus is helping stores become, you know, a couple of hundred stores and then sell. A couple of hundred stores and then exit kind of thing, stuff like connect that. Connect me with that guy. I, I don't want to exit, definitely. but connect me with him. No, no, for sure. But that's, that's what they did. They did it a couple of times already. So I'll connect you with him for sure. Yeah. Really appreciate you being on the show here, Nasser. Of course. Thank you so much, man. And uh, I'm always looking to see what's what's coming up, what's new. Uh, one of my favorite stores, I always end up tagging them anytime I go. It's uh, it's like a, a weird habit that I have every time I, I hit the store. I'm like, I got to tag them. Because the the amount of joy that I get when I go to the store, just by having, because I love fruit. For me, I'm like a, a massive fruit guy. Like I would, if it was up to me, I'd probably eat fruit all day. Nothing else. Uh, and the reason being is because it's healthy. It's, you know, you feel better. It's good sugars. It's not bad Friggin sugars. Friggin' delicious. Delicious. It's basically nature's miracle. Yeah. And, and you just pick it up and eat it kind yeah. of thing. Thank you. That so, means a lot. Thank you so much for being on the show and uh, bringing in a lot of wisdom. And then for young entrepreneurs that are watching and uh, people that are around Ottawa that are watching, there's so many businesses in Ottawa like this. They all have massive, great stories. And we would love your ideas to bring them on the show as well. Uh, so for more episodes like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hit that bell icon so you can get more and more alerts when any episode like this comes out. And uh, if you like what you see, hit the like button and comment if you want us to interview any business that you think is deserving to be on the show. Again, Nasser, thank you so much. My pleasure.